Hello, my name is Philip Girard, and I'm a professor in the history department at McNeese State University. And I'm Amber Hale. I'm from the biology department at McNeese. Welcome to Your Grandma Rocks, where we explore the lives of famous women in history. Welcome and bienvenue à nos amis francophones. Vous écoutez la radio de l'Université McNeese. On the program today, music and history as we retrace the life of a remarkable woman. She was a novelist and a playwright. She was a journalist and a political activist. She was a lover. Her name was George Sand. Wait, George? I thought this show was about women's history. George Sand was a woman. She used a pseudonym. I'm relieved. Along the way, we will explore some music from her native France. We will start with a song that came out in 2012, Le Sens de la Vie, by the French singer Tal. Welcome back to Your Grammar Rocks. We just listened to The Meaning of Life by the French singer Tal. My name is Philippe Girard. And I'm Amber Hale. Today we're exploring the life of the French novelist George Sand. Just for the record, George was a pseudonym. She was a woman. That's correct, Philippe. Her real name was Amantine Aurore Lucille Dupin, but we'll just call her George. She was born in 1804 in Paris. Well, that was an interesting time. That was just after the French Revolution, right when Napoleon became emperor. She was very much a product of that conflicted era. Her father came from a noble family with a proud lineage, but he had also been a general of the French Revolution. It was during one of these campaigns in Italy that he had met George Sand's mother. Was she a noble too? Not at all. She came from a much lower social background. 
I'm sure his family must have been just thrilled to see that their noble son married down like that. The mother-in-law was really furious about it, but there was nothing she could do as long as her son was alive. All she could do was complain about it and complain she did. Things must have been a bit tense at home. They were, until Napoleon invaded Spain and George's father was sent to Madrid as part of the occupation. His wife and daughter followed along despite the risks. I guess his wife preferred to be in a war zone than back at home with her mother-in-law. You bet. But we'll stop here for another song. My apologies to all mothers-in-law out there. The lyrics of that song are not particularly flattering for nagging women. I'm sure the mother-in-law of George Sand would have appreciated. The song is called El Medi by Mika. chanson contente, pas une chanson déprimante, une chanson que tout le monde aime. Elle me dit, tu deviendras milliardaire, t'auras de quoi être fier, ne finis pas comme ton père. Elle me dit, ne t'enferme pas dans ta chambre, vas-y ce coup toi et tant, dis-moi c'est quoi ton problème. Elle me dit, qu'est-ce que t'as t'as l'air coincé, t'es défoncé ou t'es gay, tu finiras comme ton frère. Welcome back. I'm Amber Hale, co-host of Your Grandma Rocks. Et je suis Philippe Girard. Nous venons d'écouter Elle me dit par Mika. Today we're talking about the French novelist George Sand. Before our musical break, we had just reached the point where she and her parents moved to Madrid during Napoleon's invasion of Spain. That war did not go well for France, as you know by looking at all those paintings by Goya. France eventually had to evacuate Spain and so did George's family. Then tragedy struck again. Shortly after the return to France, the father of George died in a horse riding accident. How old was George then? Just four. That must have been terrible. Yes, especially since the feud between her mother and her paternal grandmother really came into the open after the dad died. Let me guess. The grandmother used her money to get her way. Right on target. The mother came from a poor background and she had no source of income now that her husband had died. 
So the grandmother offered to pay the mother a pension, but only if she agreed to give away primary custody for the child. And with no other resource at her disposal, the widow agreed. So the young George Sand spent her summers in the countryside in the castle of her grandmother. Then in the winter, she would go to a mansion in Paris so that her mother could see her on occasion. That became a theme in her life. She was attached to both her beloved countryside and to big city life. That's very French. People who can afford it often work in the city where the jobs are while keeping an old family home in the provinces where the whole family will congregate in the summer. Another theme today is how money and marriage law were used in the 19th century to control women. The custody arrangement was strict. George could not go to her mother's home to visit her, and she was prevented from seeing a half-sister altogether. One day, her half-sister showed up to meet her, and the butler chased her away. As a kid, George was horrified. Those custody battles are always awful. We'll stop for another song about this very topic. It is the lament of a divorced father trying to get in touch with his estranged daughter. It's a beautiful song, but it always makes me sad. Who is it by? Claude Francois, who was a big pop icon in France in the 1970s. Allô? Écoute, maman est près de toi. Faut lui dire, maman, c'est quelqu'un pour toi. Ah, c'est monsieur de la dernière fois Bon, je vais la chercher. Je crois qu'elle est dans son bain. Et je sais pas si elle va pouvoir venir. Dis-lui, je t'en prie. Dis-lui, c'est important. Mais il attend. Dis qu'il lui a fait quelque chose à ma maman. Elle me fait toujours des grands signes. Et elle me dit toujours tout bas. Mais pour que je suis pas là. Raconte-moi. Comment est ta maison Apprends-tu bien chaque soir Toutes tes leçons oh Oui, mais quand maman travaille C'est la voisine qui m'emmène à l'école Et a qu'une signature sur mon carnet Les autres seuls de leur papa Pas moi Oh dis-lui que j'ai mal Si mal depuis six ans Et c'est ton âge mon enfant Ah non, moi j'ai cinq ans tu la connaissais ma maman avant Pourtant elle m'a jamais parlé de toi Tu restes là hein Le téléphone pleure Quand elle vient Quand je lui crie Je t'aime Les mots se meurent À l'hôtel beau rivage, aimes-tu la plage oh Oui, j'adore me baigner. Maintenant, je suis nager. Mais dis donc, comment tu connais l'hôtel beau rivage Y a des toi, ça te bâtit Oh, dis-lui toute ma peine. Combien toutes les deux Moi, je vous aime. Je vous aime, mais je t'ai jamais vu, moi. Alors, 
Welcome back to Your Grammar Rocks on KBYS. This was Le Téléphone Pleur par Claude François. My name is Philippe Girard. And I'm Amber Hale. Today we're covering the life of the French novelist George Sand. Before the break, we saw how, as a girl, she was caught in a custody battle between her widowed mother and her paternal grandmother. The grandmother comes across as kind of a terrible person, doesn't she? She was certainly harsh toward her daughter-in-law, but she had her good side. She doted on George and she introduced her to all the great literature of France. George loved her, and when her grandmother died in 1821, she was heartbroken. I assume that there was quite a bit of money in the will. The grandmother was rich, and George Sand was her only heir. But that did not mean that life was about to get easy for her. Her mother regained custody, and as a revenge, she cut her off from the dad's side of the family. The mother and the daughter also fought a lot now that she was a teenager, and after a few years of that, the mother explained that she was, quote, eager to find some old moustache to get rid of my daughter, who is a devil. And so, in 1822, George Sand was married off to some older lawyer. She was just 18 at the time, so she went straight from being the ward of her mother to the ward of her husband. Under French law, her husband would be her legal guardian for the duration of the marriage. The marriage was rocky. She liked the literature and the arts. He mostly liked the fact that she had brought him a big dowry. And soon enough, she was finding companionship with other men. Meanwhile, he was seducing the maids. He started to drink and to abuse her. Divorce did not exist in France at the time, so she was stuck for life. But her husband was abusive enough that she was allowed to leave him. He got to keep control of her dowry as long as he paid her a small pension. After that, she lived on her own, which was quite a revolution for a woman of 26 who had always lived under various legal gardening. It was a revolution, all right. Right around that time, in 1830, the king of France was overthrown in a revolution. Wait, I thought that the French Revolution was in 1789, before she was born. French politics are a bit complicated. The French Revolution of 1789 was the one where Louis XVI was sent to the guillotine. That's the one that we celebrate every year on Bastille Day. But his brothers came back to the throne later on after the French Revolution. And that's why there was a second revolution in 1830 to overthrow the last brother of Louis XVI. All right, let's get back to George Sand, Philippe. You know the expression, the personal is political? Yes. Well, so is fashion. After obtaining her independence, she started to dress like a man. She wore a suit and everything. That's interesting. In other programs, we covered other women who were also cross-dressers, from the pharaoh Apchit suit of Egypt uh, to Joan of Arc of France. If you want to be treated like a man, I guess you got to dress like one. One day we'll have to do a whole program on Hillary Clinton's pantsuit. <laughs> Believe it or not, a French law from 1800 specified that before women could dress like a man, she had to get a special permit from the prefect of police. Wow, laws really were restrictive on women. So what did she do? She got the permit. Smart. That's also when she adopted a male pseudonym for her literary career. And that is how Amantine Dupin became known to us as George Sand. We'll get to her literary career after our forced musical break. Do you remember how her mom wanted to marry off to some old moustache, she said? Yes. That's what our next song is about. Mustaches? Really? Yes, yes. It's a song called Moustache by Twin Twin. Really, where on earth do you find these songs? Every year there's a song contest broadcast live all over Europe that is called the Eurovision. It's very fun to watch, but it's also kitschy as can be. The song Moustache was the entry submitted by France in the year 2014. And did it win? No, it finished dead last, but I love it. Who won then? Austria. Interestingly enough, the winner that year was also a cross-dresser. The Austrian representative was Conchita Wurst, a man with a beard who wore a dress. I see what you mean by fun, but kitschy. You gotta see it to believe it. In the meantime, here is Moustache by Twin Twin. Quelque chose me manque, mais quoi Je veux ci, je veux ça. Quand je dors, je fais des rêves en dollars. Tous les jours, j'ai un nouveau costard. Chez moi, tout est neuf, tout est beau. Le monde pleure derrière mes rideaux, je m'en fous. J'habite au dernier étage. Connais même pas ma femme de ménage Il y a du cuir dans ma voiture L'odeur de mon parfum me rassure Je n'aime pas montrer mes émotions À la salle de musculation Je soulève quelques poids et altère Mon corps est une machine de guerre J'ai tout ce qu'on rêverait d'avoir J'ai peut-être tout, c'est vrai Mais moi je voulais une moustache Comme ça. 
tonnes de choses derrière mes placards J'ai des amis quand même Et même j'ai des amis qui m'aiment Je me dis j'ai tout pour plaire, j'ai tout pour J'ai le monde à mes pieds, c'est fou J'ai tout ce qu'on rêverait d'avoir J'ai peut-être tout, c'est vrai Mais moi je voulais une moustache That was Moustache by Twin Twin. You're listening to Your Grandma Rocks. I'm Amber Hill. Et je suis Philippe Girard. Today we have seen the rise of Georges Sand from daughter of the French Revolution to an unhappy wife and finally independent woman of letters. The 1830s were the time where she published her first novels, Valentine, and then Indiana, and then Layla. All three enjoyed immense success with the public, which for the first time gave her some financial independence. Until then, she had lived off money from her grandmother and then a small pension from her estranged husband. For the rest of her life, she published a lot to maintain her lifestyle. Typically, two novels a year. Her writings could be quite political. She was a regular contributor to a magazine run by Félicité de Lamenay, who was a liberal Catholic priest. In her writings for the magazine, she supported the emancipation of women, changes to marriage laws, and the equality of men and women. Even the liberal priests who had hired her thought that she was going a bit too far there. That's not too surprising that a priest would say that. There are several passages in the Bible that call on women to obey their husbands. And that's probably why she had her doubts about religion in general. She had some working class ancestry on her mother's side, so socialism was another important cause in her life. Indeed, some of her novels were inspired by the social philosophy of Pierre Leroux and about the equality of social classes. She also supported working class artists financially, and she defended demonstrators who were arrested during popular insurrections. And there were a lot of those in 19th century Paris. I figured, we're up to two revolutions already. Yes, there are more to come. George Sand is mostly remembered today as a political activist and as a writer, but she was also a passionate woman who had a complicated love life. This was, after all, the Romantic era. She did not just write romantic novels, she lived them. We won't go through all of the ups and downs of her relationships. Otherwise, we would need to broadcast a three-hour-long program. Let's just focus on a few important men in her life. The first was Alfred de Musset, one of the most prominent poets in 19th century France. In 1834, the two went on a grand tour of Italy that was quite eventful. He had visions. She got sick. He cheated on her. Then he got sick. She cheated on him with his doctor. And then they broke up. Then she cut her hair and contemplated suicide. Then they got back together. You get the picture. The relationship went on for a few years. They couldn't help but hurt each other when they were together, but it seems they couldn't stay apart either. She went through several other passionate love affairs in her life, as well as more platonic friendships with all the most famous intellectuals of 19th century Paris. The novelist Balzac and Flaubert, the painter Delacroix, and the piano composer Liszt. Liszt is the one who introduced her to Frédéric Chopin, the Polish composer who became the other great love of her life. Together, they traveled to the island of Mallorca near Spain, but the trip was complicated. Chopin suffered from tuberculosis and came close to dying, and the couple also fought a lot. You would think that by now she knew not to go on Mediterranean vacations with her lovers. Things with uh, Musset had not gone too well in Italy either. <laughs> yes, indeed. They eventually returned to France for more romantic ups and downs, and after 10 years, Chopin and George Sand broke up. The late 1840s were rather sad for her. She had a falling out with her daughter. Then many of her relatives, friends, and old flames died one after the other, including Chopin. Her political dreams were also dashed. The French kings were overthrown during the 1848 revolution. Again? I thought we got rid of them twice already. That's a different branch of the royal family, the Orléans. They had come to power after the last revolution in 1830. And after their demise, France was ruled by a republic that shared the socialist ideals of George Sand. And how long did that regime last? Not even four years. A relative of Napoleon staged a coup d'etat and ruled France as a dictator for the next 20 years. George Sand's political dreams were dashed. Paradoxically, it's during that period that her love life found some normality. She met an artist named Alexandre Monceau. 
Let me guess. He was the great love of her life. Third time's a charm. He was 13 years younger and much poorer than she was because he came from a working man's background. But he brought her peace and they lived many quiet and happy years together. Until something tragic happens, of course. Of course. In 1865, he died of tuberculosis. The same disease that had struck Chopin. It's time to stop for one last musical break. I figured we could listen to an excerpt from the musical Les Miserables, which is set during one of France's 19th century revolutions. Which one? The one in 1830 or the one in 1848? Neither. That's another one in 1832. All right. I give up with this revolution business. Do you hear the people singing, singing the song of angry men? It is the music of a people who will not be slaves again. When the beating of your heart echoes the beating of the drums, there is a life about to start when tomorrow comes. Will you join in our crusade? Who will be strong and stand with me? Beyond the barricade, is there a world you long to see? Then join in the fight that will give you the right to be free. Do you hear the people sing? Singing the song of angry men It is the music of a people Who will not be slaves again When the beating of your heart Echoes the beating of the drums There is a light about to stop And tomorrow comes Will you give all you can give So that our banners may advance Some will fall and some will This was Do You Hear the People Sing from the 2012 movie Les Miserables. I am Philippe Girard. And I'm Amber Hill. Today we covered the life of the author and activist George Sand. By the 1870s, after a lifetime of writing and, pop and political activism, she was France's most celebrated female author. It was a tradition among the leading novelists of Paris to regularly gather at a local restaurant. She was the only woman invited. She was also offered the Legion of Honor, France's top military prize, which was initially intended for male battlefield heroes. Uh, she rejected it, though. Years passed, and then in the 1870s, her health took a turn for the worse. She passed away in the old family home, where she had spent so many summers, and which was featured in so many of her novels. The year was 1876. Her name? Georges Sand. Thank you for joining us. This program was funded by a Juliet Hardner grant for Women in the Humanities.
For more information on how to help finance fellowships at McNeese, contact the Foundation at 337-475-5588. This program was also sponsored by the History Department at McNeese. To apply for a degree in history or other fields, contact the McNeese Admissions Office at 337-475-5504. Thank you and goodbye.